Okay, let me just press continue. Okay, are you okay? Yeah. Okay, so viewers, um, we're now recording. And um, first of all, I'm going to introduce myself. Um, I'm Sarah Proudfoot Clinch, a filmmaker, a holistic therapist, and I've got a passion for archaeology. I've always wanted to make a film about sacred land and looking at our ancestors and how they lived and what we can learn from them. Then COVID-19 hit us, and along with that came lockdowns, which has seen an increase in mental health sufferers and suicides. So my proposed film, Sacred Land, seeks solutions in sacred landscapes and mother nature as our ancestors did. And I've started this podcast series called Sacred Land to invite the viewers to follow me on my journey to find funding for the film and a broadcast commission. And along the way, you, the viewers, can meet these wonderful guests and experts in their fields and learn more about sacred landscapes, mental health and healing. So if you know any commissioning editors out there or someone who might want to fund my film, then please get in touch. Uh, you can find links to my website and my guests' websites uh, below. And if you enjoy the podcast, please click on the like button and subscribe to my channel. And you can find more about me and my films on my website, www.proudfoot.com podcasts.co.uk. Okay, so now I'm going to do a little introduction about my lovely guest today, John. Uh, my guest today is John Walters. He co-founded the Quest Day Collective with his um, co-founder, Sophie Higgins. Now, the Quest Day Collective is an amazing organisation which delivers bespoke and specifically tailored 360 wellness programs to organizations that truly want to engage with and understand their employees, employees' well-being and objectives. Their process is simple, effective, and most importantly, human. Their key words are nourish, thrive, and expand all words that will resonate with us. They offer all sorts of programs and initiatives from mental health support in the workplace to the built environment, which means how the environment in which we work impacts us, all of which is very important. So without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome you, John, to this Sacred Land podcast. And um, I also want to say that John has very kindly agreed to share his uh, story, his personal story with us, which will lead into uh, at the right time throughout our chat. So from now on, it's going to be us just chatting about the subject of sacred land, mental health support and mental health issues, and also uh, looking to bring it back to sacred land and healing within Mother Nature. So, um, first of all, I'm interested if you could explain uh, why you chose the word uh, Queste Collective for your company name. Great question. And um, yeah, Queste came about when Sophie and I founded the business. We wanted something that would have a real, a real meaning, but not just well-being wellness it's just you know so many people use use that word in, in in a business um respect so we wanted something that would be a little bit different and we came you know we were talking about what is the purpose of the business and it really is to sort of spread a message to communicate to help people nourish thrive expand it's we were on a quest we were on a mission and all those words you know we wanted to profit for mind um, expanding people's horizons in terms of seeing things outside their outside their blinkers, mm. and it brought us to uh, Questus, um, 
and the uh, nominative um, feminine plural of questus is questae. And, you know, one of our big uh, drum beating subjects is actually women's health. So we just felt it just sat in <clears throat> perfectly. So questae is very much Sophie and I, and the collective is our amazing group of uh, team of professionals who work with us on their varying subjects. So Quest A Collective came about that way. Okay, so you forgot to say that Quest A, Questus, is a Latin word. And I was fascinated with the fact that you called your company uh, Quest A because I studied Latin, one of the crazy aged ages uh, where they did uh, Latin at school. And um, Quest A actually means mindset. It's so mm. you looking upon it as the journey and the feminine plural, but the meaning of the word is mindset. So it, it all links in so mm. beautifully. Um, I was really impressed. I love the word yeah. and I like the name of the company. Um, and uh, if I think now about linking what your company does, uh, which has a lot of mental health support, yeah. you know, would you like to talk to us about some of the initiatives that you that you run or offer? Um, you've got mental health support for the workplace, mm -hmm. mental fitness, stress and sleep, the built environment, mm -hmm. movement, colour, ergonomics, nutrition. I mean, holistically, you're looking at the human being in the workplace and yeah. the company as a whole. Yeah, I'm, you know, as a holistic health therapist, this is fantastic. So tell me a bit more about it. Well, it, it, it stemmed from both Sophie and I's experience and both of us have been working in, uh, in corp we're both from corporate backgrounds. Uh, Sophie did a, a, a law degree and then became a um, consultant. Um, she uh, was in, in the city working and experiencing those uh, long hours, which were expected. Um, yeah, uh, and really forced upon people. JP Morgan, you just need to look at you know what's going on there recently. Um, my background was uh, initially from the um, military, uh, and then came into Sibby Street and came into corporate sales. So I sort of my career progressed through the corporate world. Oh, your as well. sound has just gone really sky high loud. You touched something then? No, has it? Yeah. Is it still Ooh. really really loud? Yeah. My arms are absolutely okay. I'm going to turn it down here. Maybe it's just here. I don't know. No, it's on quite low. Um, anyway, carry on. Sorry to interrupt you. It's all right. No, not at all. Um, yeah, so you know, both That's from, gone back to normal, both from uh, it'll be the Margate Wi Fi, um, <laughs> <laughs> deepest, darkest Kent, and uh, oh, look, there's France. Um, so, uh, yeah, both of us from a corporate background and we had both experienced our own uh, mental health challenges. Mm. Um, I uh, suffered a divorce um, about 15, 16, well, 16 years ago, which was quite, uh, quite traumatic. Um, I then relocated from my hometown of Manchester down to Margate and uh, started to, com um, to commute into London every day which at the time, the initial, it was, you know, a good, good two and a half hour commute each way. Um, high speed each commute. Way. Each way. That's door to door, you know. Um, I know, but it's a long the, time. It is a long time. Um, but that, that was a life choice. Um, but, you know, long hours and, and, and that continued. And then um, went through the trauma, um, trauma the experience really of, uh, of, of a number of IVF uh, rounds. Uh, we were oh. blessed on our seventh attempt, with our twins, which are just absolutely amazing. Um, amazing. They're, they're nearly nine now. Um, oh. But then uh, six, six and a half years ago, I got rather ill. I was diagnosed with throat and neck cancer, uh, which wasn't particularly enjoyable. Uh, came through that. Okay. Got the all clear. And then just a couple of years later, um, my second marriage uh, sadly um, broke down, which left me absolutely uh, broken. Um, and that, that breaking took quite a while. Uh, so things sort of got, got worse and worse and worse to the point where I threw myself into work 
So my career has rocketed. Mm-hmm. Um, my relationship with my young children um, was was incredibly strong. So the, the times that I had them, I had work and I had my children, but the times that I didn't have them, I threw myself into work. And when I was on my own, I sort of got a little bit off the rails uh, with um, you know, sinking into alcohol at the weekends that I was on my own. Um, not not for any other reason than I just wanted Monday to come around. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I was living for work and then living for mm. the weekends. I had the children. The problem was what I wasn't doing was living when living I had. For, yeah. Living and living for, for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And then I had an epiphany um, a couple of years ago, about, about three years ago, where I was probably at my darkest point and uh, was contemplating doing something daft. And uh, I kind of had this epiphany and, and, and shot of adrenaline that suddenly went, what are you doing? What are you doing? And it was at that point that I decided that I wasn't going to allow these experiences to define me in a negative way. I wanted it to define me positively. So I just started to read. Um, I love fitness. So, uh, you know, my physical health, bizarrely, was, was actually quite, you know, quite high. But my mental fitness was really quite low so I wanted to bring balance um, and started to research and look at all you know the what I discovered to be the sort of the pillars of well-being and we've adopted that within within Quest A Collective which I'll cover in a minute but you know that that journey suddenly I, I became open to things like getting in, into nature and understanding the benefits of actually rather than moping around on the sofa getting up and getting out no such thing as bad weather just bad clothing so I bought Mm. good clothing and I went Mm. out and you know what I enjoyed the rain on my face or the wind on my face I lived by the ocean I didn't grow up here so you know I only saw the sea you know for two weeks of a year to to suddenly see it every day every morning was I really started to appreciate where I was and what I had around me and then I started to appreciate what I had in my own life such as the children such as the friends my friendship circle had just been incredible. Uh, new friends that I was meeting because of this journey as well. And I suddenly realized how fulfilling life w- was. And that journey then really started to change my whole, I just wanted to know more. I became hungry. I wanted to, uh, I just wanted to, to understand more and more and more. And I've always been a wordy person. I've always been quite open. I'll chat to anybody. I wear my heart on my sleeve. And I, both Sophie and I said, well, what can we do to open up the question? What can we do to help others and support others? So you're, not, you're not alone. You know, mm. many of us, all of us, at some point, will go through some sort of, sort of trauma. And how do we actually acknowledge that? And how do we then react to that? And, and, and those were some of the sort of the lessons that I learned. I, I mean, I looked at it in terms of what I eat, the alcohol, I enjoy a drink, but I very rarely drink to excess now, mm. in fact, probably twice in the last two years. And, and even then, a lot of people would say that's not to excess. But to me, if I wake up with even the slightest fuzzy head, I don't like it. Mm. Um, so, you know, that, that was that. And I was looking at my nutrition in terms of what foods, you know, what was making me feel sluggish, what was making me feel lethargic, but what would also bring me energy. So I changed my whole relationship with food and then with friends and boundaries. And I became strong. Yeah, I know. Still I know. struggle with that one sometimes. Well, we all do. <laughs> yeah. But then, you know, Sophie, you know, during lockdown, it then um, suddenly we... I think we were all suddenly you know thrown into this forced lockdown we all mm. had to stop and for me suddenly I recognized how mad my life was it was just 100 miles an hour constantly um and I was all we we hear this a lot now you know where people are almost bigging up being so busy you phone up a friend and say how are you? oh god I'm just so busy it's amazing mm. actually I was thinking no it's not amazing I, I want to say to somebody do you know what I've done nothing yesterday my Sunday yesterday I just had a me day I did Mm. very little I just was in the moment I enjoyed everything I read I listened to music I danced around that Duran Duran you know can't beat it Um, (laughs) you know you know that yeah that's it you know but I yeah movement it got my endorphins going so then I went out for a walk and I just Mm. and I just enjoyed the space 
And Sophie and I sat down only a year ago. Uh, life had really changed. Uh, both of us decided to uh, jack in our, um, our jobs, our careers, and change and do something together where we could actually open up the conversation with businesses and get them to understand that actually supporting your people, your yeah. humans, um, and, and actually recognizing that every element of our life, whether we, if we have a challenge at home, that's going to come in the office mm. because you might not mention it, which was the old, mm, don't bring your problems into the office. It's but still you're carrying there, it. Still mm. there, still here. And that causes an effect. So by getting employees, uh, employers to understand that that really can have, you know, damaging negative effect. Um, and the statistics that have come out in the last, you know, couple of years, particularly last year, especially from the Office of National Statistics and from the Mental Health Foundation, mm. uh, you know, and the NHS as well, you know, they really have been mm. h- horrific. And, and, and employee, employers seem to be now understanding this. What we need mm. to do is not just get them to understand, but actually to put into place action to support going back to those pillars of well-being we we've termed for the quest a collective the quirkle see what we've done there and and they basically all intertwine all these eight elements they intertwine with each other but as you touched on you know they look at it looks at you know our our, as mentally so our mental well-being but also societal particularly now with people going back into meeting people and the you know those anxieties of 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 mixing or getting on the tube or getting on the bus spirituality and that doesn't mean you know going to church and breaking away for it could do it could be anything it could just be grounding yourself with mother earth and mother nature getting out into the woods and just looking up and seeing the trees and listening to the you know that that element of spirituality financial is a big thing environmental and that's not just environment itself but we talk about the built environment Mm. actually you know the connection between you know the space that we work Mm. and how that actually affects us um oh it's it's huge huge Huge. absolutely huge it can work it can have an effect on whether you're productive or whether you're not productive um you know the chinese have feng shui and feng shui is all about space around you and yeah. how you are placed within your space mm. and how every item is placed around you and how you are interacting with light. I notice on your website, you've got this amazing blog about the power of natural light. Yeah. So, you know, before I go into that, though, I just I just want to touch back on your personal story mm. because I'd like to bring a bit of clarity in there, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. When you said you started to have daft thoughts, yeah, can we can we just clarify that so that we? I was know sitting on a cliff. Yeah. So my my, my road um, literally is about a hundred meters long, and at the end there is a, a beautiful promenade at the top of the white cliffs, and okay. um, there's, there's a fence there, and I do not remember going down there. Do not yeah. remember it. I remember suddenly. <laughs> waking up uh, just coming to my senses and going what am i doing what am i doing Whoa. and and, and the, the fight or flight bang straight yeah. in there everything and i pushed myself back against the fence and i you was literally on. i had you know i, I was frightened really yeah. frightened and got back over the fence and i went home and that was the moment i just went i, I got in crying my eyes out felt really really lost yeah um slept like a baby yeah well no, sleep is one of the greatest no, i didn't you know, sleep like a, a baby. I slept a like a rock. yeah yeah i didn't sleep like a baby because babies wake up every few hours and need feeding i slept like a rock and i, and I woke up the next morning and never had so much clarity and um yeah that, that, okay. that was me just... so so the other thing is that uh i f- correct me if i'm wrong but i understood that you also um are a wild swimmer yeah so you know it, that connects deeply with ancestrally uh how our ancestors were so connected with their environment they lived yeah. eat breathed worked slept slept sleep in their environment yeah and 
They got their healing from Mother Nature. They got their food from Mother Nature. They got their rituals from Mother Nature. And here, if you if you are, you can tell us a bit about wild swimming. But wild swimming is deeply connecting yourself with Mother Nature and cleansing and water. So, so tell, tell me a bit about your... Well, I've always loved there. swimming in the sea. Um, always, I've always loved swimming. I mean, swimming was my thing when I was younger. I used to swim for this, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in... Um, up in Manchester, I used to sw swim for the local swim club. I was part of the uh, snorkel club and then I did scuba diving. And so I've always loved to be in water. I, mm -hmm. I often wonder why I joined the army and not the Navy. Um, but um, it, I've always been, I always had the connection with nature, love camping and so on and so forth. When I moved down here, just getting into the sea evoked memories of childhood, really happy memories. Uh, but it became more than that, you know, it became a fitness thing for me, but also just nothing better than being in the sea. But I didn't really understand why until I started going through my journey. Now, Margate has a very, very famous sea bathing hospital that was built over 200 years ago. It's now beautiful apartments, but, um, the, you know, they, they used to bring people down from the city to convalesce because of the, the air, the salt air. And Margate was also uh, famous for the sea bathing machines. So they used to actually have these sea bathing machines. They were invented in Margate. And they would actually take ladies and gentlemen down into the water. They would be towed by a, by a horse and they would take them, take this car into the water where the, where the gentry, the ladies and gentlemen would go in and submerge themselves in water. They didn't swim in those days, they just went yeah. in because it was recognised that there was benefits from the minerals, but it was only open to the, to the posh lot. So, you know, whereas the locals were just, just washing it. Um, anyway, that, I've always loved it. And then when I was going through my, my journey, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, I'm always on my journey. Yeah. I just started to understand the benefits and, yeah, connecting. So it's, it's sea bathing rather than, I do like wild swimming, but don't really get the opportunity to do that much. But I do swim most weeks, um, mm. well, really every week, mm. down at the uh, Lido, which is a tidal pool that we Excellent. have here yeah. in Margate. It's the biggest one in Europe. It's absolutely mm. incredible. Um, and I go down there and I, and I go in and I, and I swim. And I do that all year round. Yeah. So I'll be in in January for about, you know, 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes. Um, last week I was in for a good 35, 40 minutes, you know, because it feels like, feels like a warm bath now compared with January. Yes, it would do. Um, but it is incredible because, you know, once you actually understand that, yeah, it's not just the minerals, it's getting out into nature. You become very, you become one. Yeah, connected. With, yeah, you're completely connected. connected. Um, but also once you understand, you know, how to actually cold water submersion, it's more about getting into the cold water and understanding how to control the mind yeah and control the breath that actually tricking our body from the sympathetic nervous system into yeah. the parasympathetic nervous yeah. system which is actually allows us to calm and control once you learn how to do that in an environment such as cold water it makes it a little bit easier to control it when you're in an environment such as being in front of a screen mm email comes through or a phone call comes through that causes you understanding actually how to bring your core back into one of calm can have huge huge benefits so that's really more about it for me it's so control. i take it that you will know about mr vim hoff yes the ice man cometh <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, Wim Hof is incredible, <clears throat> but you know, there is um, <clears throat> just walking down into Walpole Bay and stripping off and jumping into the pool for mm -hmm. somebody like that is 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 great. But anybody else doing that, yeah, you're going to give yourself such a shock. Oh it's... gosh, absolutely. But the the but he is all about the breath and the water and the healing. Yeah. Uh, benefits of water and again he himself was in his wife was in a deep dark oh, yeah. depression and Incredible so, yeah so water and and I was you know very interested that you went down that route hmm. um, so we talked about mental health statistics and I'm just going to read you a few which you will probably uh, connect with or know about but for our viewers um I just want to remind people that the podcast series, that this podcast series and the proposed film is about 
the increase in people suffering from mental health mm. issues and in suicides um, since COVID-19 and lockdowns and how we can learn from our ancestors how to derive healing from Mother Earth and from our sacred land. Mm. Um, since COVID, more people have experienced mental health issues during COVID-19 yeah. than ever recorded before. Their teenage suicides are on the rise. Mm. That, that sentence alone can't be skimmed over. Teenage suicides are on the rise. Yeah. Police are being contacted by helplines to attend homes for attempted suicides yeah. from 16 year olds, 13 year olds and children as long, young as 11 years old. Mm. So that mm. means for the viewers to understand the helpline, the child is on the end of the helpline, the helpline on the other side contact the police whilst they have the child on the line. Downstairs, mum mm. and dad are watching telly, cooking a meal, doing whatever they're doing. They have no idea their child is upstairs about to commit suicide. Mm. And so the police get to the door, knock on the door, and eight times out of ten, they they end up with a, a positive result of you know helping the child and getting the parents and the family to have um, some counselling and help. Uh, but that is a serious situation that we don't even mm. think about. Um, and then we've got three quarters of all suicides in the UK are male. Yeah. So that's what's happening to our male society. And then one in five people in the UK have suicidal thoughts. Yeah. So, yeah. that you know, to me, this is indicating that, you know, humankind is becoming very sick in the mind mm. and if we don't look at our environment and our workplace and how we treat one another and holistically look at every element mm. of how we live then you know are we going to become sicker uh, you know one of the things that i'm quite keen to point out is that we live eat breathe sleep work play Mm. in concrete buildings mm. and so that disconnects and of course we have the social media and the screen problem mm. either mobile phones ipod pads mm. or um huge big screen televisions so yeah. there's a disconnect <sighs> and we need to think about that and perhaps you know we can discuss that now Absolutely. I mean, the statistics are absolutely frightening. And, and of course, they're the, those statistics where, you know, the um, child calls the helpline and the helpline then call the police. That's where, thank God, that child has had the oh, courage I know. to make that call. An 11-year-old. And, and it's frightening. And then the parents will then go through an awful trauma. trauma. Um, Terrible trauma, not knowing. Yeah, it's, uh, and they, you know, there's, they will then try to understand why they why they didn't know, and that. Yeah. And, and the single fact is, people don't like to talk about their mental health. It's true. Because people are frightened that they are going to be judged negatively. Yeah. Um, the Mental Health Foundation did a survey February this year, uh, found that 38 percent of British workers fear revealing a mental health problem at work because it would jeopardise their career. Yeah. 17% of them said they were worried they would get negative judgment from colleagues. 45 said they were likely to make up an excuse as a stomachache or yeah. back problem for absence uh, because they don't want to talk about their mental health because they, they're fearful that they will be seen as weak, particularly men. Well, so the we, we, we is men high for... just, you know, we, we pull your socks up, lad, you know, man up, you know, get a grip. All these things that um, that you hear being said, and that puts the fear of God into people that they don't let me just, want. Let to... me just move the cat. <laughs> oh, right, that's the that's the microphone gone. <laughs> and do you know what? This is the beauty of what's happened in the last year. 
we have suddenly become human in everything. I know. <laughs> I've had my son walk through in here in his pants. Yes. I've had my two kids come up to me. They've been, you know, my two younger ones. So the pants was the adult child. And then the young ones were told, I'm going on, I'm going to go on a podcast. So I've got a big meeting. So, you know, don't disturb me. Here's some Haribo. Here's your iPad. Go and sit in the <laughs> And then they both came up to me not to disturb me. They went, Dad, Dad. They thought they were not disturbing me by whispering. And of course, yeah. I'm trying to deliver a workshop now. Anyway, cats. I know. Uh, cats but you see, but, but the being human is also a part of what you were just talking about yeah. being judged we we are not perfect as human beings oh, we yeah. cannot be expected and it also it's great that we're not perfect yeah. because that's where we have character that's where we have um humanism a humanity yeah. and creativity and imagination all comes from our imperfections as well yeah, as totally. our uh, skills and uh, and abilities and social we, media has certainly well, we, had a huge play yeah it has because it's image going, based yeah and, and, going, and perfection going is what people seek the girls are seeking perfection in the makeup and in plastic surgery yeah and also the boys as well have got pressure yeah. in how they look i mean when i grew up my my brother picked up a hairdryer to blow his hair mm. blow dry his hair and i said what are you doing with that Boys don't blow dry their hair. I'll tell you and, a and, story. and he and and my mother worked for um, a skincare company, Lancome, French, a really yeah. expensive, um, you know, face creams for the moisturizer and everything. And she brought them home. I never even touched them. I was such a tomboy. And she said to me, Sarah Jane, you're you you know the cream is going down. You can't be using some. I said, well, I'm not even touching it. <laughs> and so she went to Andrew, and Andrew said, well, it's in the bathroom. Why can't I use it? <laughs> You know, that's not that there's anything wrong with that, but boys used no. to be a lot tougher and a lot um, less worried about their appearance. Absolutely true. Uh, I'll give you a little very, very funny story. And then when I was serving in the army, I was based over in Germany and I was in um, I was in the cavalry, armoured cavalry, so tanks. And uh, one one morning uh, just after Ravelli, so the light was just starting to peek through the clouds. The uh, the troops suddenly heard this wee sound. And they didn't understand what it was. <clears throat> and they realised it was coming from my tank. I was driving at the time. And what I'd done is I'd got my little portable hairdryer. Oh. <laughs> and I stuck them into the, into the batteries on the John. tank. I'd moved the wing mirror. And in those days, I had a great quiff of hair. I had a oh. hair. And I'm giving it that with the hair, getting it all right. And then I got the Dax wax out and, a, you know, give it. Oh. And my nickname was Wendy. <laughs> from there on. But I, oh. which was great. You know, they ripped into me. But I've always enjoyed the banter because that was the first time in my life that I actually felt I hated school. I was bullied terribly. Because yeah. I could never fit in. And it didn't matter who I wanted to try and fit in with, I never fitted in. And I got into the army and suddenly we were all fitting. In it, together. in it together. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. And it, and even my, you know, my haircut and mincing about, it was, um, I fitted in and it was great fun. But yeah, that was, uh, but yeah, it's very true. Men have got this, it's in a, have, have had this inability of talking, you know, and stiff upper lip. That's you know, the old mm. British thing, isn't it? Mm. And um, being fearful. And, uh, you know, changing room mentality, locker room mentality for the call in the States. And uh, it, it, it's been a challenge. And actually, you know, there is a huge proportion of men who do take their lives, particularly over the age of 45. Um, and that is because they get to a certain time of life and they realize, you know, many, many things start to flood their minds and they don't seek help or they don't know how to mm. seek help. And that was one of the things that I, I struggled with when I was going through my challenges. <clears throat> But through perseverance and just carrying on and carrying on, I guess it was that that control mentality, that military mentality. I just wouldn't give up. And I found so much resources out there. And there is so much incredible resource. And that's what we want to do is spread the word. And you know, when we engage with our clients, it's very much about getting the executive team on board and getting them to really drive this throughout the culture of the business. So it's not just about ticking a box. It's about actually recognizing there needs to be a shift in culture and everything that we talk about at Quest Day with our clients in or in, it's in a corporate environment 
everything is transferable. Yeah. All the skills. In, into so, our everyday life. Totally. And our everyday relationships. Yeah. But often people say, that's common knowledge. Well, common knowledge is only common. It's only knowledge that's, that's to the, that everybody knows about. Problem is, not everybody knows about things like how to actually manage your own, um, you know, your your um, your own mental um, your you own know, mental health. Yeah, your own mental health. And uh, you know, and I, I, we, we term it the sort of resilience toolkit, and we all carry around a, you know, this 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 toolkit with us. Uh, whatever you want to call a metaphor, could be a handbag, could be a bergen on your back, could be could be anything, could be a little tow trolley. But we all have it. We just don't necessarily see it. And I've been blessed over these last few years. I've built this incredible resilience toolkit. And, you know, I still have days where I question myself or I feel I feel low, I feel a bit net. But I recognize them. And rather than fight those emotions i just go all right okay you're there winston churchill was good as he he used to call it black dog he did yeah and he would say okay you're there i see you mm -hmm. and then he would go out and do the things that would that would make him feel better he accepted it you're there and black dog would eventually just go oh i'm bored mm -hmm. <clears throat> and disappear whereas if you if you fight it black dog gets more into you more into you and this resilience toolkit this year has been has been unbelievable. This last 12, 14 months. We talked about mobile phones and screens and, and the blue light that we emit from our, we get from our devices. We are now looking at a screen mm. so much longer. We're not only looking at our laptops, we're now looking at iPads and iPhones and then TVs when we, you know, sorry, other devices are available. Um, and we look at our TV. And the thing is, in the office you'd be sat at your screen, mm -hmm. but then Bob would walk past and say, oh, did you see the football? Oh, oh yeah. So you take your eye off or you go for yeah. a break. Yes, or, or exactly. Distractions, yeah. Or you go to a physical meeting with humans, mm -hmm. whereas all that's gone now. So we we have no decompression time. We have no space away. And I remember talking to a friend of mine who worked for the NHS. And her job suddenly went on to Zoom. And she was, I was saying to her, you know, she said, my eyes are watering at the end of the day. Mm. And it's because she's at the screen. And when you're concentrating, you forget to blink. You're not being disturbed. You might as well just build a wall between you and the screen. Yeah. And then at lunch, she's on that. Then in the evening, she's on that. No wonder. Mm. So we do some talks and we talk about, you know, getting away from blue light. And if anybody gets anything from this, if you're working on a screen, we will talk about ergonomics and that's, you know, the, the our, our physical well-being. Um, and, and one of the tips that, you know, we will always pass on is every 20 minutes or so, just take a 20 second break. Yeah. And look out of the window at something 20 meters away. Now, if you're living in a concrete block in, in the city, you still have a window. Just look up or just look across, but just for 20 seconds. Mm. and then go and then go back but mm. just allowing your eyes to readjust from the blue light mm. another great tip turn all your devices onto night mode so my night mode comes on at zero zero one hour and it goes off at, at 2359 mm. so it's virtually permanently on this loop of um of night mode mm. which just reduces the amount of blue light blue light raises our cortisol and when our cortisol levels are high we are in our sympathetic nervous system. We're in fight or, or flight. Fight or flight, yeah. And people in the evenings, when I when I used to commute, uh, of course, you know, I might have an hour of snooze. I'd be decompressing. I'd be reading a book. Well, I'd that would be turning your cortisol off. Your adrenal totally. glands would turn and I used off. To, yeah, absolutely. So I would actually come home feeling quite relaxed. Of course, now people, the other thing is, you know, people were people are now working longer hours mm. because you don't you know nine to five is, is is a thing of the past now it's now more like eight to six because we're well, hopefully that's really going long. to change because it's not um well, it's it not healthy and what's happened is that we've lost we, you know all this work for what 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 is the point of all this work to feed the greed and power of other you know, the, the owners of the company or people above them. At the end of the day, as human beings with souls, we hmm. are spiritual beings inside yeah. a physical body. 
We yeah. deserve to have a good work play, um, uh, a, a work play balance. Well, and it should we, be. It, we, well, it should be a play work balance. Yes, exactly. Actually, and we need to um, have the time out of work to tap into our imagination and yeah. our creativity. Yes. And everyone is an artist. We it, we require ourselves to remember that we are all artists and people think that artists is just somebody that paints or does pottery or you know and that they are the artists to create a meal and present it to your mm -hmm. family is an art to decorate your home is an art to go out and garden and grow your vegetables is an art yeah. and we all need to do things which are much more outside of the workplace and the work format and yes. something else i wanted to mention that you can perhaps talk about is that with men right they have in their dna our ancestral dna the hunter gatherer yeah and the hunter gatherer is about providing hunting for your family or your community and providing food and shelter yeah. And uh, it's a physical act in the DNA of the hunter gatherer. And I I feel myself as a female looking at men have so somehow been displaced in society. They do not know their place. You can correct me if I'm wrong and we can talk about this. Uh, but I feel that men need to be doing something more physical than just watching screens and um getting and and earning enough money to pay a gardener and to pay someone to grow your vegetables if you're you know uh, have enough funds for that but even if you don't have funds people are just not actually doing physical creative imaginative things you're spot on and i, I, I think you know the whole thing about in our i think it's less about nature saying that you know we are hunter gatherers i mean we well it's in your dna it's in our dna but i also think it's just about it, it's often about just nudging people in the right direction and the mm. problem is we don't educate enough we don't communicate enough starting in the curriculum curriculum now to talk about well-being and mm. emotions uh which is great so my my two children my twins are in year four and they're they're learning well learning that they're now communicating and teaching each other about uh, emotions and about feelings and so on and so forth um but you know our, our generation we we never had that you know completely completely different uh, and we need to change that so this new younger generation you know they are the, the very young i'm not talking yeah. about the, the high school yeah. kids you know, starting to talk about feelings and emotions at 14, waste of time, because nobody at 14 is going to suddenly go, yes, I, I, I struggle with this, I struggle with that. It needs to be done right at younger age, so it's normalised. Mm. It's just a normal Just part of the toolkit that we have. And so also, I, I was, as teenagers, their hormones are raging. Completely. So they're never going to, they're no. never going to share. Um, and and because there's so mis they don't want to be seen as not knowing, so they'll put on the bravado and, that's, and boys as well. You know, and boys can be terrible. Uh, you know, girls can be as well, but boys in particular, because we're less knowledgeable. So you took at sex education, for example, and you talk about girls learn. You know, they'll start to learn about menstrual cycle, about the periods, and what it all means. Whereas the boys won't be taught anything about that, mm -hmm. so they don't know how to react mm -hmm. when they see something at home or in school or or they hear something mm. and they don't say that well, they, they just don't block it. so they just what do they do is they turn it into a joke and then somebody yeah. becomes the brut of you know the bunt of that joke the butt of that joke and then that hurts them and and but they don't say that they've been hurt by that so it's just it's a cycle it's a negative cycle it's a cycle and, and you know what for uh, you know particularly you took nine out of ten women um, felt that the menopause had a negative impact on their working life. That came from Davina McCall the other week when she yeah. talked about um, yeah. yeah, sex myths and the menopause. Absolutely mm -hmm. incredible. And I, I posted a lot on my social media saying, guys, you need to watch this. You absolutely need to watch this. And even a couple of my associates or you know contacts said, 
why? Why do I need to watch it? Because you either have a wife or a mother or a business partner. You've got a sister. Yeah, or a sister. Daughter. You know, wise up, mate. You know, get get a grip. Learn about it. And and actually from that, what will come is compassion. But going back to it, needs to needs to be starting right at the very very beginning. I was adopted uh, as a baby. I do not remember it. I do not remember being told. It was a normal part of our conversation in our household. So it was never anything different to me. So why can't we have that conversation about mental health yeah. and well-being? Yeah. My eight-year-olds will quite happily sit down and talk about their feelings and their emotions. Mm. And they have both learned what to do when they're feeling a little bit worried. And they will come to me with their books and they'll say, that's how I'm, that's how I'm feeling at the moment, Daddy. Right. And then we will talk about that openly. And then he or she will then go off and do what they know makes them feel good. But the other leaves her or he alone so they can actually yeah. go and enjoy yeah. some. Well, it's some- understanding. So you're teaching that very young. Um, yeah, it's I'm, normal I'm, for them. I'm mindful that we're one hour and five minutes into this. It doesn't oh, feel wow. like it, does okay. it? Sorry, and, I didn't The talk. cat is still. So just go the over gobby there. northerner in me. <laughs> I mean, it's such an impressive. Well, I'm, I'm the gobby Irish um you know irish background we, we so well forever then couldn't we yeah i mean it's exactly. such an such an important uh, subject and getting businesses to recognize all these elements and you talked about those subjects that we you know that we talk about and, and thank you for that but yeah, you know, women's health is a big part of it mm. men's health is a big thing getting workshops and i i stand up in front of men and go look you know th- this is me this is what i've been through and it's amazing how many when, I, when we get to the q a how many hands come up and go mm. do you know what i recognize that thank you for sharing and mm. and and well, suddenly that, the boys start talking and that's why i thought if i haven't got the funding to make the film yet how great it will be to bring people together on the podcasts so that we can share and if we if your story and our conversation helps just one person out there then thank you god thank yeah, you yeah totally thank god because I, 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 it's a it's a tough old world out there and it is. the more love we can share and the more we can encourage people to connect with their environment with sacred land and yeah. i want to point out that sacred land isn't just you know a fabulous you know 3000 year old yew tree forest in mm-hmm. chichester called kingly vale or avebury or um what's the big one Margate <laughs> Stonehenge <Beach>. Stonehenge <laughs> you know um they, they are sacred places but the yeah. sacred is anywhere we are I have behind me these flowers if I have no garden and I live in a high-rise block of flats and I can focus on those flowers and see the beauty in each petal and each leaf that is my sacred land in that apartment block I, I live in a flat I live in a flat. My tiny little balcony has astroturf and it has loads and loads of plants. Inside my house, yeah. I, I'm, I've got flowers. Yeah. I've got plants everywhere. Yeah. I'm, I'm connected. So I look out the, the window. Sacred, the sacred yeah. is everywhere all around us and within us. And what happens yeah. when we connect with um, on a woodland on a walk or mm. uh, a sacred river or any river now, um, yeah. is that we connect. When we connect with nature, what we need to understand is that we're connecting with our soul and with ourselves. And that's what brings us down to a yeah. place of calm and a quieter mind. So the, on our on our website, and thank you for for, for, no, for noting that you've had a look, at, we, we do some blogs, and one of the articles is on the happy hormones. And uh, we, we wrote oh, I this. I love that title, happy hormones. Yeah. And how to get them, how to get them flowing. And yeah. one of is get out in nature. And it's funny, you know, I, I was talking to a mate actually on Saturday night and um, we, we got quite deep and, uh, and and he actually said, yeah, I always feel great when I go for a walk. And when I was talking about it, he went, I never knew that. I never knew that. That's why it makes me feel so good. I yeah. just thought it was, I was just getting out of my space. I was just getting out. I said, well, you are, but you're connecting with nature. You're breathing new air. Your heart rate's going. Your, your adrenaline starts to, mm. starts to pump and you're, you know, you're, and, and he, you know, your serotonin starts to, I never realised that. That's why I just don't, it's, you know, I can, I'm clear when I get outside and of course it you clears are. The it clears you the know, head. Clears the head. In Kingly Vale, 
um, which is in uh, just outside Chichester. It is a, a three thousand year old yew tree forest. It's wow. amazing, and it's got a prehistoric um, Iron Age uh, settlement outside the forest. And then at the top of the hill are Bronze Age barrows. Oh my God, it's a fabulous place. It's got wow. everything. It takes about five hours to walk all the way around it. And um, I made a, a short film about Kingly Vale before, and uh, I met the guardian of the wood and his name was uh, Richard Williamson and he's the son of um, Henry Williamson Martha don't interrupt um, and Henry Williamson is the author of Tarka the Otter which has a profound effect on many uh, people from our generation and yeah, onwards I've actually got the book here yeah. written just after the first so, book so you can imagine the son of Henry Williamson very connected yeah. to nature he's the guardian of this wood so he's wow. been the guardian of the wood for 50 years and the cat has just <laughs> never mind never mind right Martha just... never work with children or animals I know darling I know well, I think we might just have let that drop. Um, and when uh, I was filming with him, he said to the presenter, he said, when I come here to this woodland every day, he said, uh, it's like going to church for me. Mm -hmm. This is my sacred place. Yeah. And he said, if you look at um, walking where we're walking now through a, a grove of old ancient yew trees, we have the roots, the gnarled roots all around us, which are connecting us to Mother Earth. Yeah. He said, and then we have these wonderful branches all the way going up into the sky, connecting us to the heaven or the universe. He said, and we are walking through our church. He yeah. said, and just for me to be here brings yeah. me the peace and quiet yeah. and calm and re-energizes me. And yeah. um, that phrase you know, from this amazing gentleman who was wearing socks up to his knees <laughs> and fabulous brogues, walking shoes, and shorts down to his knees, <laughs> and wearing a, a sort of semi-military colonial type outfit to come to his job every day um, and How work wonderful. with nature. So, you know, if we're going to end it anywhere, it's with nature can be our church, can be our sacred. I'm going to church in a minute. I'm going down <laughs> to Walpole Bay Pool and I'm going to be swimming for about half an hour. And I know that when I get back, I will just be feeling just so energised. And it is so true. And it can be your sacred land can be anywhere that you choose it to yeah, be you just need to be able to find it and appreciate it and, and really understand the connection to it and then yeah and thank you john uh, for, thank um, you so being, much being here today and sharing and really for sharing from your heart what to, some people are very difficult subjects to talk about but mm -hmm. showing that we can talk about them and normalize it because yeah. that's where the healing comes and I really appreciate your your time today. Oh, thank it's, you. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you for inviting me onto the uh, the podcast. And, and I truly okay. hope that people have enjoyed my contribution. My yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to stop recording now, and um, we'll come back again another time. 